Welcome to Computer Networks. This is lecture 12. We're going to talk about homework 6, which has not been posted on the web yet, but I want to give you enough information so that you can get started today, at least thinking about how you might do it. We already discussed exam 1, the solutions. Um, the solutions will be posted online as well. So just look out for that if uh, you're not satisfied with some of the answers that we um, talked about in the class. And we'll return the exam at the end of this class. Homework 6 is going to be about rate limits. The major theme towards the end of the last series of lectures was about how do you know the right rate at which you should send packets. Right? So how do you increase the rate, how do you decrease the rate, so on and so forth. So we're going to explore some of that. You'll be asked to do three things. And this will be based on the HTTP client and server that you already wrote. So the first part is going to require the client and the server to negotiate a rate at which they will transfer the file. So when you launch the client, there will be an additional command line that says, okay, this is the you know, maximum rate at which I'm willing to accept data. When you launch the server, there will be a flag that says this is the maximum rate at which I'm willing to send the data. And you actually need to compute the minimum, right? So that's the first part. The second part will require your concurrent HTTP server. And what the server should do is allocate bandwidth fairly across all the clients. So this is how it'll work. When you launch the server, you say, OK, you know, this is the maximum aggregate rate at which the server will serve the files. So let's say 10 megabits per second. And when there is one client that connects to the server and says, you know, get a file, the server should send the data at 10 megabits per second. And the moment second client connects to the server and asks for a file, that takes us some time to download, the rate should actually decrease. Right? It should be half. It should be 5 megabits per second to the first client, 5 megabits per second to the second client. It should dynamically adjust the rate. Does that make sense? Now let's say these two transfers are happening, and now we have a third request coming in. So what should the rates be? 3.3 megabits per second for each client. Any question about that? So it's a pretty straightforward uh, exercise. And finally, the server will also implement a rate throttling algorithm. And it'll be pretty simple. The idea is like what uh, approximation of what various uh, cellular data service providers do today, which is if you try to download too much, then they decrease the rate, right? At which you can download data. Okay. So uh, we'll do a very simple approximation of that. And this is how it's going to work. Uh, you'll specify several, param uh, several arguments in the command line. And one of them will be the reason in which you're, you should be allowed to have fast download. And then the second argument will be the rate at which you'll get data after, if you exceed that limit. And the goal is, if the clients are downloading small files, they should be able to just download the whole thing quickly. And if you're downloading large file, the first you know, megabyte or something like that that you'll specify in command line, you should, you'll actually get a high uh, throughput for that first part, and then the rate will go down. And we're not going to make it uh, go down you know, gradually, et cetera, because that's kind of complicated. It'll just you know, go down in a step function. So let's say you know, the rate at which you're uh, typically serves 10 megabits per second, you're going to receive the first megabyte in 10 megabits per second. And then as soon as you reach that you know, one megabyte limit, your rate is going to go down to, let's say, 10 kilobits per second. You'll specify all this in command line. And just to make uh, your life uh, simpler, uh, a single binary does not have to support these three types of operation. So I'll actually ask you to write three separate programs. Well, that means three separate names, just to make it easier. Otherwise, uh, there'll be too many, um, you know, uh, command lines, uh, command line arguments, and you, know, you might ask question about, okay, what if, uh, uh, you know, there's a cross between uh, subtask one, subtask two, so on and so forth. So, any question about ho what homework six is uh, supposed to be about? Yeah. Can you use no, you cannot. You have to use uh, your uh, HTTP client and HTTP server. 
uh, you'll get the standard code. So please uh, post a message. We already have HTTP server that's a standard, right? So if your HTTP client did not work properly, then we'll definitely provide. But uh, don't uh, wait until you get that standard code because you should be able to start designing, okay, how you might do this. Any, any, any other questions, concerns on how you might proceed? So one of the things that you need to learn, so the point of all this is to learn how to keep track of the rate at which you're serving clients and how to adjust that dynamically. That's what we're trying to learn in this assignment. Any any other? Right. So yeah. Back on part one, like client and server negotiate rate. Like, how does that how does that happen? How does that happen? Yeah. So in HTTP, how might that happen? I mean, it's in, in the header sends in, in the header the max rate that it's capable of accepting, yeah. and then the server compares that to its max, its max send rate. And you might send the minimum. So uh, the suggestion here was, client should uh, put some maybe custom header, uh, some field. Uh, in which it will say, okay, this is the rate at which I'm willing to accept data. And server has its own thing, and it will compare and make the determine the right rate at which it should send the packets. So for the first one, we have to write the client and the server? Uh, you, just, you already have the client. Okay. okay. Right? Okay. You're going to use the HTTP client. There will be an extra flag that says max rate or something like that. And the reason I'm splitting them up into three different files is just to make your life easier. Any, any other questions? No. Okay, I'm sure you'll have some questions maybe on Monday. <laughs> when uh, we're organizing these different programs in our source folder, does it matter if we put them in different directories or do you want them all in one directory? Uh, we want uh, all of them in the same directory, but uh, you know the instruction will tell you what this should be called. And when you type make, it should compile this well, to three. We could set up make so that it compiles them all. Even though they're in different directories, though? I mean, uh, would that be acceptable or no? Um, I would rather not do that because remember, we have to grade you know, 30 plus homeworks. And uh, yeah, of course, you know, there, there's a trade up between making it easier for you guys and also making it easier for us. But what is your main concern about having everything in the same folder? Let me try well, to I've understand got, that. I've got a one that's really easy because it just goes and looks at whatever source files you have. Uh -huh. um, and it'll compile just based on that. I but see. But if, if you've got three programs in the same folder, it'll try to compile all of them into one. I see. I see. So, so you, your make file sounds more advanced than it needs to be, at least for our purpose. You can actually put this, so basically you have one command that will compile one file, right? You can just have three lines to compile three different programs and that'll do it. I think you have more advanced make file than, well, was, than what you need. Well, that's why I was asking, because if I can, I'd like to yeah. use that. If not, I'll use the other one. That'll yeah, 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 yeah. I think let's do the simpler one, you know, just put three commands and just to standardize, you know. I think you're going to get annoyed a little bit, but uh, just to make things uh, simpler. <laughs> yeah. All right. So um, we have one minute, but we're gonna we're gonna try to at least uh, understand what uh, the next series of classes are going to cover, because we're not going to cover you know what we talked about today. So we're going to talk about routing. Before we understand what that is, let's uh, think about the model of internet that we talked about in the class. This is, a, this is a slide from the first lecture, if you remember. We said the internet consists of nodes and some set of technologies to connect those nodes. Right? And there are all kinds of nodes. And here is another slide that I showed you in the first class. And again, here it seems like there are some links. right? And there are these uh, places from which we're trying to connect or send packets or receive packets. So this was uh, sort of what we talked about in the first class. So in this context, what I want to talk about in the next series of lecture is routing, not forwarding. And this is a commonly confused terminology. Routing only deals with finding the routes along which you should send packets. Nothing to do with how to forward those packets. Okay? So that, that's the key distinction. Forwarding only deals with how to efficiently, quickly send the packets. And the way they interact is 
the router will build what is called forwarding table, which tells the forwarder the links along which it should send the packets. Commonly, you might also hear the word control plane and data plane. Control plane is concerned with maintaining this topologist's view of the internet uh, so that you can compute the routes along which you, send, you should send the packets. And the data plane is concerned with how to efficiently manage the incoming stream of packets. And based on the information in the forwarding table, how to efficiently send them out into the network interfaces. Any question about the difference between routing and forwarding? Okay. Is everything done? Okay. So uh, let me just take uh, one more uh, minute. So we talked about the need to understand what the network looks like, because that's the only way we can compute the paths, right? So that's what the routing protocols do, and that's what we're going to talk about for the next few lectures. So what we're trying to do is find the optimal route, not just any path, optimal route between two nodes. That's what we're trying to do when we're talking about routing. And what are the challenges? Dynamic topology, the map that represents the internet, changes over time. Why might it change? Yeah, power goes out somewhere, someone puts a new link, et cetera, et cetera, right? It's decentralized. There is no single entity that says, okay, you're allowed to put a link here uh, in some country. It's a, it's a decentralized model. So if it is a decentralized model, why does, why does that uh, make it harder to find paths? Because there's no one authority you can say, hey, where is this and what's my best route? Right, so you can't go to a single authority and say, okay, I want to go from here to here, or I want to send my packet from here to here, what's the best route? You have to somehow negotiate among all these uh, entities. And finally, scale. Internet has a large number of nodes, and you need to be able to get to all of them. Right? So that's, that's the other challenge. So we're going to talk about uh, routing protocols and how they address some of the challenges starting next lecture. Okay?